spot, nah, I'm Jay. C-Dub on the beat. Back against the wall, CL20's knocking ready. IGI's tripping, validated, shoot ready. Brown incarceration, got my people living daily. Gang wars, back hey, yo, to back. with everybody, man? I hope everybody's having a productive day. Feeling blessed, and like I always say, it's one life, one chance. We only got one chance to do this right. Let's get it done. So trip out on this video, man. This takes place in Tulare County. And like I said, Tulare County is pretty much homeland of Farmeros, Norteños per se. But throughout the years, man, Sureños have been, you know, establishing themselves in Tulare County, so to speak. And that's why a lot of gang wars continuously happen because for a very long time, you'd hear like one or two, you know, Southsiders here and there. But now, inevitable. Including recently an Albert Meek, this guy right here. He was one of the ones that started Local Park, a Sureño neighborhood in the city of Visalia, right in the neighborhood of Norteños. And uh, he just got shot the other day at a gas station uh, uh, with some youngster. He got busted in Porterville. I don't know if he was from Visalia or Dinuba, but there was a confrontation in front of the gas station and he lost his life. Dude wound up going to prison for some time, but you know he got out. He was the founder of Local Park and he died. So in this particular video, we're going to talk about this neighborhood right here. It's in Ivanhoe. The audio was like 2003, 2005, when it was really announced like big, when the, even law enforcement were like, okay, we're going to have to go check these guys out, man. They popped up out of nowhere. We're saying new graffiti. But anyways, I was locked up in 2001 with one of them. That's how I knew the audio was a little bit before 2000, 2001. When I was busted in Juvenile Hall, there was two Sudanians at the time there. And a pile full of Norteños. They didn't even get touched. Well, Memo, he, he was a representative of Porterville, a gang that's a, a Sudanio gang in Porterville. And uh, dude, that dude was huge, bro. And I talked about him a long time ago. I seen that dude and I was like, I was 13 years old, 5'2", 120 pounds. This dude was like 6'3", 6'4", 280 pounds. Enormous, built like Shrek. And I looked at him and I was like, damn, fool, I didn't even know they grow that big, bro. Like, Jesus Christ. He's, he ain't even gonna whoop me, bro. He's just gonna eat me like a wiener snitch or hot dog. That's it. That's all I would be to that guy. And then I wound up going to Max in Juvenile Hall for uh, beating up a Southerner. And I think I split his eye open and I, I broke his nose. So I went to YA right after that. So when I get to Max, there's a Sureño in there from this neighborhood right here. Crazy effing Mexicans. And uh, these guys are in Ivanhoe. Ivanhoe is always known to be a Southside King territory. Or else he has their own Sureño gangs. Uh, Linnell Camp has a Sureño gang. Porterville has a Sureño gang. Vasilia had a Sureño gang. Tulare had a Sureño gang. Every city that had Norteños, there was a Sureño audio right there. This one in particular is really known to be in the Ivanhoe area. They beef with a lot of homies from Catela. They beef with homies from Visa. They, they're around. But Ivanhoe, Ivanhoe right now as we speak in Tulare County, I want to say is pretty much the homeland for... Los Carteles, I'm going to say it like that. The big guys. I mean, it's look, it's very agricultural, so to speak. But everywhere, everybody's growing in. That's where a lot of the indictments that have been taking place in the last few years when it comes to Sureño Barrios have been coming out of Ivanhoe. Them dudes got connects across the border, so to speak. So crazy effing Mexicans. Like I said, I met that Sureño in Max. He was tall too, and he always walked around with his shirt off. It was a trip me out. He has uh, he has CFM on his stomach, and then he had it in cursive on top of it. Crazy effing Mexicans, and nobody put hands on him. But any other part, you know, if the, if the it was funny though in juvenile hall, if the Sureño looked beat upable, they would beat him up. But if they came in with some size, I didn't look. I didn't see all the older homies, all the big homies that had some size and some weight, wearing a different weight class. Press these dudes. I'm like, wow, well, man. So I'm brushing all the little ones, but when the big ones come, we're like, wow, what's up, fool? See you on the streets, homies, in about three months, homie. Yeah, homie, I'm going to eat this coffee cake, bro. I'm going to eat this SOS, homie, with this biscuit. And that's it, fool. Don't even trip. I'll catch, you. I'll catch you on the rebound, fool. I don't know. I never got that part. I fought a lot in juvenile hall. I don't know why nobody else did it. But in this particular case, we had a uh, we had a dude that just got out of prison who was the Yabero, the shot caller for CFM. And his name was Robert, a.k.a. Shorty. Just got out of the penal system in January 2009. Or a little bit before. And he took over his audio and he was pressing lines on everybody. Wanted everybody to fall in line, listen to him. He wanted it to be known that he was the shot caller, that he took the he took the keys back. He took the audio back. Well, they wound up finding his body on January 2009. 
dumped in the orchard, beat, beat bad, like punctured wounds and everything. They, 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 the for the the forensic teams pretty much seen that man. Didn't he blunt force trauma to the head, to the back, even to the groin? His nads, they kicked his nads, and um, shot him multiple times, and they found his body by the uh, a day later after the incident occurred. So they actually threw a party. It was Shorty, a Sureño named Conejo, Casper, Dodger, Flaco, which happened to be Shorty's primo. This, I'm gonna I'm gonna emphasize the primo part, and another individual named Gangster. So they were at a previous party and they were getting drunk. They were chopping it up. They were in the backyard, you know, having a great time. And then they wound up leaving that party and showed up to Conejo's house. Conejo's right there. Everybody's in the backyard. Conejo's dad's asleep. Don't make any noise, homie. Um, my padre, bro. He'll, my dad, bro. He'll kick us out right now, bro. And I'll be grounded for like a week and a half, bro. We need to be quiet. So they're in the backyard, but they were already buzzing when they showed up to Conejo's house. Drunk as hell. And an argument broke out. And it escalated. What the argument was is that Shorte, Shorty, the one that has the llaves for this whole video, is pressing gangster. And he's telling the gangster, like, hey, fool, like, you don't put in no work. You know, trying to check him in front of everybody, y'all drunk and gangster speaking up. Like, I do put in work, fool. You've been gone for a minute, bro. You know, I've been out here doing my thing since you've been gone. And immediately, just drunk, punches gangster in the mouth and drops him. And then he jumps on gangster and he starts choking him. So when everybody else that's standing around sees that happen, they wind up jumping sort of there. Their own shot caller jumped them bad while they were arguing, trying to break up the fight, trying to get them to separate. Well, they finally get everybody to separate. And short is like, man, now hell no, you know, you guys need to give this fool a check out before he put his hands on me. He did this and this and that. Give him a checking, bro, a discipline, bro. He needs to, we need to put in work for the hood. He needs to put in work for the hood. He ain't been doing nothing. Then you had Casper right there speaking on gangsters' behalf, like, hey, this fool's been putting in work for I've been there, bro. I can vouch for that. All these fools are trying to calm Shorta down. Shorta doesn't like that. And obviously, he realized that they weren't getting to him, that he wasn't getting through to them, and bam, starts fighting again. So they start jumping him for a second time, a second time, and they're beating him up pretty bad this time. And he bre they break him up, and he's like, hey, bro, I'm gonna, you, all you fools got something coming, homie. All you fools got something coming. I'm going to kill all you mother effers. Woo, woo, woo. Payback's going to be a mother. Woo, woo, woo. Starts cussing at them all crazy, right? But they're trying to defuse the situation. They're trying to calm old boy down, the OG down, the shot caller down, but he ain't having it. And he continuously said, like, hey, fool, you guys need to give this fool a check out, bro, for not putting in work. Man, I know he hasn't put in work. And they're still trying to vouch for this dude. So Shorte decided when he was drunk, maybe, he, maybe his tongue got the best of him. Maybe alcohol got the best of him. But uh, he pretty much said, uh, F the vario, F all you fools. You guys got something coming. They jumped him again. And when they were jumping him, they were, I think it was the crowd was leaving, trying to just get away from this fool, and he rushed a couple of them. So they finally started jumping him. Now, mind you, the second round when he got jumped, right, Gangster handed Gonejo a pistol and was like, hey, fool, go put that in the car real quick. Fool, get rid of that real quick. So Conejo winds up dropping it off in the Primo, Flacos. Uh, he had a great cutlass at the time. Parked outside. He puts the gun away. Goes back, tries to separate everybody. Um, th after the second round, this third round right here that they're jumping them, right? Like from the back going to the front to the driveway, the Primo runs in the house and tries to get a knife and tries to stab his cousin in his ribs. But the knife breaks. The handle breaks off. But there's still a little sharp edge to it, but it didn't do nothing. But this time around, the third time, they didn't stop. They just kept beating him up. The dad comes out, says, you guys are making too much noise. You guys need to get the F out of here. You name it. Every, there was a lot more witnesses because, you know, obviously the brawl got a little louder. People started intervening. People started coming outside. People started noticing. And sure enough, they beat him too bad. Way too bad to the point like he's immobile. Almost half to death. So what did they do? Well, one of them, Flacco, he goes inside and he grabs a shotgun and he grabs a shotgun and he puts it in the car. And they literally dragged this fool's body, all these Sureños, including the Primo, and opened up the trunk and threw him back there, slicing his throat, throwing him back there. And they drove off. And they left Conejo, didn't want no part of it. He stood behind. He's the one that did the testimony during this whole trial. And sure enough, bro, they wind up taking him to an orchard, not even like five, 10 minutes away from the location where they beat him up three times. And shot him multiple times, including in the groin. 
and dumped his body right there. Now, there was a lot of witnesses to this case because some people came forward after the Sureños ended up at a party and ended up at a house and were pretty much like talking to each other like, hey, food, it could happen to you if anybody says anything to anybody. Uh, Shorty happened to be dating a girl at the time where he was living at. He was living with Flaco. And that girl witnessed all these dudes talking about what they did to Shorty. So she had her testimony in court too. Well, they wound up finding the body anyways. And the cops couldn't believe how many times this fool got beat down, how bad his body looked just from the beatings alone, according to the forensics team, and then shot multiple times with 30, 357s and the shotguns. And everybody got busted for it. And Conejo, being that it happened at his house, that was his body, he was present for it, but he didn't have nothing to do with it, so to speak, other than a couple of assaults jumping in the first two times. You know, he did what he had to do to save himself, and he testified on all his homies. Now, what trips me out about the story is, right, they all got 25 alive plus indeterminate prison sentences, gang enhancements, you name it. Let me point out some aspects. So we got one shot caller who came out of jail. And what trips me out is like the shot caller of the neighborhood, his own little homies took him out. I mean, the tables do turn, betrayal is serious. But we're talking about a bunch of Sureños that are at war with all of Tulare County Norteños. And they're too busy in the backyard fighting each other, taking each other out. So we got multiple people that got indicted on this case. So they lost their manpower. They killed their shot caller. But what's crazy about it is that this shot caller was really trying to punk this kid. And really trying to punk everybody else and throw his weight around. And the tables turn. You know, what goes around comes around. They literally put hands on their own big homie. Even though he came out the pen with directives to get the body together, to line him up and make everybody start smacking all these Norteños. This dude came out with the intention to tell every Sureño from CFM that they needed to go out there and put in work and start killing Norteños. And when he decided to question one of his own, they jumped him multiple times. And another thing is his own primo indulged in it. His own primo backed up his homies over familia. Maybe he probably seen, yeah, my, my primo's in the wrong. But as a family member, don't you think you should have intervened and be like, this is my cousin, this is my barrio, let's try to resolve this, it shouldn't be getting out of hand. But he turned his back on his own blood. Blood's not thicker than mud in this case. And he even tried to shank his cousin, and he was the one that sliced his cousin throat before throwing him in the trunk of the car. Like, how could you be a family? I could never do that to my cousin that passed away, man, he rest in peace. Man, I would have went to war with anybody for my cousin, no matter what he did, unless it was an S offense and I did it myself. But I would have went to war with my cousin. And that sucks that I wasn't here for my cousin's death. I wasn't here to back up his play and to go to war with everybody for him. So I would have went to war with my family. Family is important. Family is everything. Even though family can be a certain way sometimes, and some people sometimes you gotta turn your back on family. Family's family, you know? And he didn't he chose his body over his family. So that's the crazy betrayal that I thought about when I read this case. But what tripped me out about this case is, like I said, you hardly ever hear about that. You always hear about shot callers making youngsters take out other youngsters. And he, he you know, he made the call. He's the pintero. He's the llavero. He's the chingon. Get, get mas firme que wow wow. But in this case, he was the one in the wrong trying to press youngsters. And he got to see firsthand what youngsters are capable of when you back them up in the corner. And they retaliated. But I think they went too far. But the thing about it is... Here's another thing that I want to talk about. You know, this whole overall, this whole case was like, it was very intriguing yet dangerous. But like I asked myself, man, they started drinking. They were having a great time before everybody got buzzed and got drunk. And I've always seen alcohol do that to people. That's why I'm so afraid of alcohol. Yes, I'll say it all over YouTube. You guys can criticize me and make fun of me all you want. You know, there's, there's, man, how am I going to say this? But, um, you know, I look at other dudes, right? And I, because I'm always trying to reevaluate myself and how I could be a better man, how I need to conduct myself as a man, you know, what men do that I, I'm not capable of doing yet or I haven't learned yet so I can be a better man. And I've always tripped out like I, I see dudes out here, man, they be driving trucks, they drink like three or four beers and, and you can drive like nothing. I, I, I'm always talking to my coworkers and they're like, yeah, man, I can't wait to go home, man, crack a couple of beers, man, chill with my kids, woo woo. And I always, that one soon they say crack a couple of beers, man, I, I can feel that fear in my head, like, bro, I, can, I mean, that must be a nice thing to do. I'll crack a soda or some vitamin water or a sparkling soda that I have or sparkling water, so to speak, that I that I buy a lot because, you know, I try to stay off sodas a lot. But still, 
like I see that, I'm like, man, that's man, that's what make men out men out here. I trip out on them. You know, some dudes just love to have a beer, a cold one. I just feel that fear every time I think about it, every time that subject comes up. I don't know what that fear is from. I was drinking Pruno in prison like crazy. But you couldn't you couldn't approach me and be like, hey bro, wanna have a beer? Like all these weird thoughts come in my head and I get all judgmental. But in this case, right, I had a homie that passed away and I haven't told his story yet. His family asked me never to tell his story. But I'm gonna tell one of the stories. I'm just not gonna say who he is. I have pictures of him. But he used to drink a lot. A lot, man. I got great memories of him before he got killed in Tulare County. Great memories of him. I got pictures for days with me and him. And uh, I miss that guy. And uh, that's what happened. You know, he got into it with his family. He got drunk. Things escalated. And he died at the hands of a family member. Just like in this case. And I always see that alcohol leads to that. You know, everybody's having a great time, bro. But I don't know how many cases and how many scenarios that I've been placed in where... Alcohol will get the best of you. And, you know, you can't control your tongue. And some people say they can control themselves. They know how to maintain their composure, but don't. And I think that's the one thing that scares me to be around that environment is, you know, I don't want to lose my composure. I don't want my anger issues to come out. I don't want my PTSD to snap and I start snapping at people. That's what I'm afraid of. And I'm afraid, like, throwing away my freedom, I don't want that to happen. So that's why I won't drink a beer with anybody. I'd rather be sober. I'd rather be content. I'd rather maintain my composure. I'd rather be focused. Yes, I sound boring, but still, because I've seen it so many times. And once you, that, that drunken rage kicks in, bro, you're not going to hold back and nothing's going to stop you. There's cases where people caught cases and got jail. And all they can say is like, bro, I blacked out, bro. I was gone, bro. I couldn't, I couldn't, I don't remember nothing, bro, but this fool's dead and I'm doing life or I'm facing 15 years, 25 years. You know, that's the thing about alcohol. Now, in this situation, like, what if they didn't get drunk? Do you think, oh, boy, what is still confronted to do? Maybe that's what brought it out of him. Maybe he had it in the back of his head and he got drunk and it just all came out. And look what happened. But if he wasn't drunk and everybody was just having a kickback time and had their limitations. You know, I believe in limitations. I believe in, you know, go out there and have a few beers, but don't go overboard with it. You know, be safe, be responsible. I'm a firm believer of that now. Yeah, I know it sounds corny, but I know you guys are going to judge. So... That's how I see things now. And in this case, you know, he probably could have saved his life if he didn't get, you know, the drunken balls and, you know, got belligerently drunk and decided to say, you know what, I'm going to throw my weight around and press these youngsters and I'm going to have this fool beat down just for my own satisfaction. Well, it didn't turn out like that. And his own video turned against him, beat him three times. I mean, kicked him in the, in the you know what, multiple times. The medical examiner... For the, for the autopsy report said his groin, they did damage to it, bro. So they were kicking him there and they shot him there. And for his own cousin to say, you know what? I'm going to do this for my audio and I'm going to protect my audio and I'm going to stand up for my audio. I'm going to slice my cousin's throat and throw him in the trunk because he questioned another homie of mine. And just dumped his body in the orchards without remorse. Crazy story, right? Thought I'd share that story with you guys, man. Interesting story. I don't know if they're still around. This case was in 2009. I know about them since 2001, 2003, somewhere around that area. But um, yeah, it's a audio in Ivanhoe in Tulare County. So with that being said, like I always say, it's one life, one chance. We only got one chance to do this right. Let's get it done. Peace.